this episode of Travelog, it's adventure time as we make our way into Tibet, retracing the fabled Tian Horse Trail. We're taking on Death Valley for your viewing pleasure before a welcome bit of food and questionable dancing in Lulang. Onwards and upwards as we head to Shubar Castle before reaching the highest point on our trip, an astounding 5,013 meters at the Mila mountain entrance. Finally, we arrive in Lhasa and take in the incredible atmosphere of this iconic city. Witnessing the hardships of the pilgrims to Tibet, escaping through Death Valley, and listening to hymns in the most remote church in China. These are some of the highlights of an amazing adventure along the 1,500-year-old Tea and Horse Trail. Travelog takes you on a legendary and perilous journey, joining a modern-day caravan as it winds its way among the rugged mountains from Yunnan to Tibet. It's a journey through a land of almost untouched culture and natural beauty. Retracing this fabled cultural and economic lifeline in China's history, join Travelog on a three-part series, Adventure on the Tea and Horse Trail. In the second part of our Tea and Horse Trail adventure, starting from Li Jiang in Yunnan, we finally made it into Tibet. We watched in wonderment at the extent of human resilience during a pilgrimage, surveyed a salt kingdom at the center of many wars throughout history, and took a hike around the Lake Geneva of the Orient. It's been a thrilling adventure, and one that's not about to end just yet. Welcome to a travel log special in cooperation with Trends Traveller. We're on a sixth day of our Chamai Gudao adventure and hopefully today I'm going to get to taste some chicken hot pot and also go through Death Valley. So follow me. It's not as if we need a reminder of how high we are. But that said, it feels out of this world to be quite literally driving through the clouds. Not only this, but I actually feel like I'm back in Europe. Yet we're at 2,800 meters in the Lulang Forest, a 100,000 hectare sea of trees on the east side of Mount Sagila, the 15th highest mountain in the world. The resemblance to Europe stems from the mild weather in southeastern Tibet, which nurtures this lush woodland. I, um, I, I ate something bad last night and um, I've been sick all morning. In, from every angle and uh, have had very bad diarrhea and then as soon as the um, filming was over I had to run to the bushes outside with uh, people everywhere and, uh, and, uh, and go to the toilet and that hasn't happened to me very often so you know what an adventure we arrive at the Tongmai bridge built in December 2000 it lies at the entrance to the Tongmai valley which is ominously known as Death Valley. This part of Tibet has a dark history due to the natural instability of the terrain. In June 2000, the largest landslide in China in the past 100 years swept through here. The moraine, when it poured into Yigong Lake, produced massive flooding that closed the Sichuan-Tibet highway and destroyed a dozen bridges, including the one that was here. The repercussions were felt far beyond China, all the way to India, which lies downstream from the lake. Well, um, we managed to cross the, uh, the Bridge of Death, and uh, we're now uh, driving along at uh, a relatively slow pace because the road is intensely narrow. I mean, you, can only, you really can only just fit the one car on this road, so I hope nobody else is coming the other way. Um, there's about a 200 foot drop on our left hand side and, uh, and uh, I, just, I just hope it doesn't rain because uh, if it rains it's going to be easy to slide off but uh, this is, uh, it's adventurous, it's an adventure, it's an adventure. Um, it's also, it also gets the blood running, you know? 
This is probably the only time on the whole journey that I wish I was the Magwoto walking rather than being inside this toy rattle. People talk about being thrown around like a rag doll, and that's exactly how I feel on the road through Death Valley. <laughs> Just hanging around this, uh, this uh, very, very, very narrow path. Um, I really, really hope that the camera's doing justice to it because, uh, you know, we're, 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 we've got a 200 foot drop directly to our left. And uh, if, uh, if Lu Rong takes a wrong turn, then, uh, then we're screwed. With every excruciating meter, it feels as though we're about to come off the edge. We spend every minute fearful of a wrong turn. There's something very exciting about the impending danger and the idea that, you know, one slide on a bit of mud and, and we're hanging off the edge. Now, I don't want to tempt fate, but... See, look at that. We've got rocks and landslides just here again. There's a maximum five kilometers per hour sign. So, uh, let's make sure Lu Rong doesn't go over five kilometers an hour. Um, so we've literally, we, we're gonna have to stick ourselves to the side um, to let some cars through. But look at it, I mean, it really is a road for one car. Um, and, uh, I don't know what the car etiquette is on this one. Um, but look at that. There we go. There's the drop. There you are. Sunny. And now we need the Trends Traveller leading car to get us out of yet another perilous situation. A five car convoy going one way, a 21 car convoy going the other, and a large truck in the middle. <laughs> Luckily, there's a junction, so the organisers managed to move the truck onto the side of the mountain. Eventually, we all pass without any of the cars sliding into the precipice. On the left-hand side, there's evidence of another major road collapse. 14 kilometers and three nail-biting hours later, we emerge physically unscathed. But hopefully, there's a reward awaiting us ahead. In a more relaxing atmosphere, we find our reward, a healthy portion of the famous Lulang chicken hot pot. There's nothing more likely to make you hungry than what we've just been through. And it's clear that the group thinks so too. Happy eating! So I'm getting to finally try this uh, chicken hot pot and uh, the interesting, uh, interesting thing about this is that it's uh, the actual stone from which it's cooked has been taken from the mountains uh, up above and everything inside is organic. Let's see how good it tastes. Mm, good! Hun hao chu! It actually really, it's got a different, I don't know, maybe it is the, the stone that it's cooked in gives it a certain, a certain taste. The stone hot pots are made in Muo Tuo, home to two ethnic minorities, the Memba and the Luoba. It is the only place in the country that is completely inaccessible to cars, so people have to carry the stones by hand. Here in Lulan, it is the only place in China where you can have this type of hot pot. <laughs> Our drivers have hit the dance floor, and all I can say is that Tibetans really can dance. There are many styles of Tibetan dancing according to different regions, and none 
is ever easy to imitate. But that doesn't stop our group from giving it a go. Keen to immerse myself in Tibetan culture, I wade in with my excruciatingly awful dance moves. It's a slight contrast with the beautiful free-flowing dancing we'd been treated to minutes earlier. That said, the ladies are extremely polite and actually attempt to replicate some of my moves. It's a rare sight, foreigners on the tea and horse trail. In fact, these are the only foreigners we come across on the whole trip, and they're from Holland. The scenery, the big mountains, that's really impressive because we come from a country where the highest mountain is maybe 200, 300 meters. So here you got them like 7,000, 7,000 plus. And that's it's magnificent. Amazing. It's really amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's, but really it's, all, it's also the, the, the country life. You, you drive through and you see it's, it's a big pass you have to take. You mm -hmm. go all the way up, you go all the way down, and then it's different. Yeah. People are different. The, the language is, well, not the language, but the, the dialect is a little mm -hmm. bit different. The houses are a little bit different. And that's the way you travel all the way to, to Lhasa, and everything is changing. Yeah. Every time it's changing. With the road conditions improving, it takes only around four hours to get to Linja. I finally arrived in Linja, and I'm lucky enough to be beside one of the most beautiful rivers I think I've ever seen. That is the Yalong Dambu River, which is the birthplace of Tibetan culture. Now this beautiful river is steeped apart, along part of it by one of the most scenic spots in the whole of Tibet. That is the Yalong Dambu Gorge. But first, Take a look at how clear that water is. I actually feel like jumping in for a quick swim. Have a look. The Yalong Zambu Valley is 72 kilometers long and often referred to as the cradle of Tibetan civilization. That's mainly because of its abundance of cultural and natural relics, such as ancient temples, monasteries, castles, caves, and peaks. The river snaking its way through here is the Yalong Zambu, which gave its name to the valley, as well as the ancient line of Tibetan kings. Our first stop today is Shuba Castle. Built in the latter years of the Tang Dynasty over 1,000 years ago, Shuba is the best preserved castle in the region. Legend has it that King Ghazar, the great hero of Tibetan people, confronted the Chingba Nabu monster here. For three years, King Ghazar was unable to defeat it, but then he received some divine assistance. The gods informed him that the monster was weakest at dawn. Armed with this knowledge and with his sword, King Ghazar was finally able to vanquish the monster of Shuba Castle. So it may be a little bit cramped in here, but I'm still completely impressed by the actual structure. I mean, if you look over here, you can still see the remains of wood over a thousand years old, keeping the structure together. And then if you come and look over there, you can see some holes from which you can look outside. Extremely impressive. I'm intrigued to discover what the differences are between a Tibetan castle and the castles I've visited in Europe. In this part of Tibet, there used to be many castles scattered around, but only a few remain. It's a feature of Tibetan castles that in their design, they take into consideration the natural conditions locally. So they're all different, depending on where they are. There are three main types, built of either stone, mud, or wood. Shuba Castle is a stone and wood structure. Well, our luck was bound to run out sooner or later, We've taken a wrong turn from Suba Castle and find ourselves 150 kilometers adrift of our next destination. In the end, our detour is 300 kilometers long, but at least we make it to a sacred Tibetan lake, a place you can't and won't want to miss. Whoa! 
Well, we finally made it to the Ba Song Swar Lake, and I'll tell you what, it's really been worth the wait. This place is amazing. It's so beautiful. Um, it's actually the holy lake for the red sect of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, and uh, Ba Song Swar actually means green coloured lake. And I think it's pretty clear why it's called that. Have a look at that. Ba Song Swar Lake is as green and clear as pure jade and the swimming fish can easily be seen in it. Known as the Pearl of Southern Tibet, it is acclaimed in Tibetan culture as a paradise on earth due to the richness of its natural beauty. This is one of the most widely visited tourist spots in Tibet, recognized as a world tourist attraction by the World Tourism Organization. There's more to the lake's appeal, however, than just aesthetics. On the island, there is a small but exquisite temple. It was built over a thousand years ago during the Tang Dynasty by the Red Sect of Tibetan Buddhism. Monks of the Nyingma Sect, because they wore red hats, were better known as the Red Sect. Founded in the 11th century, it is the oldest sect of Tibetan Buddhism. It observed practices of Buddhism that were deeply rooted in the Chubo Kingdom of the 8th century. So the sect called itself Nyingma, a word meaning ancient and old in the Tibetan language. Because of its age, the sect is closely associated with animism and with the worship of sexual reproductive organs. I haven't actually had any lunch yet, so it's very kind of them. I haven't had any lunch, and everyone's looking at me um, very enviously from the side. It's good. Ah, Mm. Good. good beef and bread, solid mountain food by the lake. So uh, I've just had a little chat with, uh, with the, the very welcoming people here and uh, they've explained to me all of the dishes. So uh, what I just ate was some good beef, solid beef, very good. And uh, also I tried some of the uh, organic pig from, uh, from this area, which was very nice. Uh, what you can see there, which looks like a beef jerky, is actually uh, yak's meat. Uh, which I've tried once. Very nice, very nice. We've got spicy chicken here, uh, some more beef, some vegetables. This is great. This is a uh, spicy chili sauce if you really want to, it's a bit hot today, but if you really want to spice up your day, here's some of that. And then uh, a good bit of tea to uh, wash it all down. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> So we're at the Mila mountain entrance, and guess how high we are? 5,013 meters, 25 centimeters high. That is extremely high. In fact, that's the highest we've been this entire trip. I'm not actually feeling any altitude sickness, which is strange. And um, I've been told not to get too excited, even though this is the highest I've ever been in my whole life, ever. So um, I'm going to try and not get too excited, but what I am going to do is I'm going to throw lots of Tibetan Buddhist good wishes up in the air, so follow me. Now, my Tibetan good wishes. Yay! 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 day of our wonderful adventure. We finally made it to Lhasa and I'm stood here on this beautiful and bright sunny morning in front of the Jokhang Temple which was built in the 7th century and is arguably, the, it, no it is the heart of the Tibetan people here and if you have a quick look around you can see that in fact this is the Bokum Square which is the heart of the city. For most Tibetans, the Jokhang Temple is one of the most sacred and important temples in Tibet. 
Built in the 7th century, it commemorates the marriage of the Tang princess Wang Chang to King Tsongtsen Gampuo. The temple stands above a pool with the princess likened to a witch's heart. In long streams, the pious Tibetan pilgrims walk clockwise around Barkor Square, chanting prayers or performing full prostrations. Pilgrims, like the ones we met during our tea and horse trail adventure, journey from all over Tibet to worship here. It's easy to be swept up in the wondrous swell of humanity filling Barkor Street, which surrounds the Joking Temple. It's a lively and bustling place, roughly 600 meters long. The whole of Lhasa has a distinct religious feel about it, but Barkor Street is both a religious and trade center. You can pick up all sorts of goods here, from food and traditional Tibetan merchandise to all sorts of religious artifacts. I'm also very surprised to find such an international vibe in Lhasa. There certainly seem to be as many foreigners here as I've ever seen in any Chinese city. An uncommon sight for some, a normal thing in Lhasa. Tourists and pilgrims, tradition and modernity, both seamlessly mixing in this part of the world. Lhasa was our final destination, and it's also the final destination on the Chama Gudao for our tea. So after eight days of adventure, I think it's uh, quite apt to uh, perhaps uh, barter for some tea and see if I can take some home uh, back to Beijing. So have a look. This is actually Yu Yunnan tea. Yunnan Xiaguan something cha. Well, obviously my Chinese isn't good enough. But uh, if you have a quick look, they actually have the characters emblazoned across the block of tea. So uh, Xiaguan um, is, uh, is what it says here. Signifies it's been uh, it's, uh, tea produced in Yunnan. So uh, it's followed our entire journey of the Chama Gudao. Pretty interesting. So I've just purchased myself some uh, Yunnan tea, and uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's pretty significant that uh, well, they were trying to sell me the Sichuan tea, but I actually wanted tea that's followed the exact same route that we have over the last eight days. So uh, I'll happily drink this and uh, have some great memories. Shukwaima. <laughs> Well, um, gentlemen's just been filling me in. Uh, the products here are actually from India, and uh, that, that kind of gets me thinking about how this, you know, Lhasa really still is a, uh, a hub of uh, economic and cultural exchange, much as it has been for, for, for hundreds of years. And uh, in a way, you know, Nothing really has changed from uh, from the from the uh, Chama Gudao and the people bringing all their goods here. Incredible. The cultural mix of traditional Tibetan culture and Western influences is clear to see. This is especially true in art circles, where Tanka, the traditional Tibetan paintings, sit side by side with oil paintings depicting everyday Tibetan life. Tana Palace gives the impression not of having been built by man, but of having grown there so perfectly does it fit in with its surroundings. I'm humbled by its beauty and magnificence as much as the Tibetans, and all those who respect and are fascinated by Tibetan culture. Well, I'm stood in front of the extremely impressive Patala Palace, and uh, I'm trying to put myself in the position of the Ma Guo along the Chama Gudao because this is actually the first thing they would see from miles away and I'm sure that there would be a huge sense of relief as they saw the Patala Palace across the landscape. However, in a sad way, this is actually the end of, uh, of our adventure along the Chama Gudao and it really has been something 
deeply, deeply impressive for me. I mean, I can't go through all of the highlights, but possibly the, the pilgrimage and uh, watching the people and, and uh, how long those, uh, that it takes for them to arrive here in Leicester. And also uh, surviving Death Valley was obviously a, a big, big highlight. But uh, in any case, this is just the end of the beginning. So make sure you join us for another travel log special. I'll see you next time. Bye.